uh, because if you come from the Middle East where you've got hot days and cold nights, you know, the classic continental climate, then the idea of covering your armour with something that stopped it from heating up too much or, or losing too much heat is just basic common sense. So we've got a range of usage which we can document from the 12th to the 17th century, early 17th century probably. We've got a fairly detailed description of how they could be reinforced by extra layers of mail inside from, from Osama. Um, we know Osama and his father went as far east as Isfahan um, on various military uh, expeditions where they were working for the, the Khalif in Baghdad or various Turkish emirs in the, in the kind of somewhat fragmented Seljuk Sultanate of the time. Uh, the this is a fairly widespread thing. It almost certainly there were versions of it in Europe. I mean, the Europeans were um, quite attentive to what they saw happening in the Middle East when they could do something. About it. In the same way, I, 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 you've probably seen the, the famous um, Ilkhanid or Jalayarid painting. I'm not quite sure which it is of Isfandiyar and the dragon where he's yeah. wearing articulated gauntlets and articulated legs, which are perfectly Persian in decoration with gold borders and everything, but quite clearly have some inspiration from European plate armour, yes. which wasn't quite that developed at the time the painting was done, but there's, there's references to the Ilkhans importing, I think it was either 300 or 3,000 suits of European armour, which would have been taken apart and rebuilt into... Yes. Appropriate army for the for Persian use. So the, 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 we're not again, as we were talking about with the crossbows, it's not a closed world. Yeah. The ideas were moving backwards and forwards. I mean, to be perfectly clear, it wasn't a completely open world either. There's there's a, a, a Burgundian traveler who wrote a memoir about going to the Middle East in the 1430s, Bertrandon de la Broquière. And uh, he mentions that as a Christian in Mameluk-controlled Palestine and Syria, he wasn't allowed to own a bow and arrow, a composite bow and arrow, because they had they didn't want to transfer the technology. And uh, he had a Mameluk friend who disguised him as a Muslim so he could carry all this stuff back to France. Uh, the... Uh, it's very, it's, it's an interesting book. I, I have it in old French and, and English translation. Unfortunately, I've got the old French one first. This is about the time of, of 9-11. And my, I ordered the book online from a bookseller in Australia and it turned up in old French. <laughs> and um, it's so strange that my, my uh, second French teacher was an elderly man and he, explain to us what the circumflexes were related to in old French and all this kind of stuff. So I actually, when I saw it, I knew that E-S-T-R-E was the same as E-circumflex T-R-E, and I could actually read it. It took me five weeks to read a tiny book, uh, and it had lots of useful stuff in it. Later on, uh, at 9-11, I ordered an English copy, because I, when I ordered this, I didn't know it was in French. Uh, it, it didn't say and so I ordered an English copy from a New York bookseller and then everything blew up. And I said, look, I understand if you can't fulfill the order. And he said, oh, no, no, we're just dusting off everything. We'll send it to you. Oh, and the, God. Uh, oh, God. And, uh, uh, and it, was, it was really brilliant because being a Frenchman, Burgundian at the time wasn't a Frenchman, but being a Frenchman... He appreciated the details of ordinary life. He loved Turkish bread. He was the first person to write about yogurt in French. Uh, he loved picnics. <laughs> I mean, uh, traveling the Turks had a picnic system where they had a big round leather tablecloth with a cord around the edge. And when you'd finished eating your lunch, you pulled the cord and it made a big bag and all the leftovers you took for the next meal because <laughs> nobody was rich enough to throw food away. 
And but he does talk about thumb rings and bows and armor and things like that, so it's quite interesting. But the, the this whereas ideas moved backwards and forwards, there were some restrictions. This might be the reason that outside of Italy and, and the Balkans, you don't get a lot of composite bow production in Europe. Um, there's a there's some beautiful bows that were produced by Europeans in the 15th, 16th century, either in Italy or in Hungary, because one of them signed by Hungarian, which clearly are showing strong influences from Eastern composite bows and are also really well built. So, so technology was moving west, but looking as we did a, a while ago at Oriental cross, crossbows, it's quite clear that the crossbow bows used in Spain, for instance, were wholly European in design. The crossbow itself was different, but the bows were wholly European. They weren't. If you look at the, the bows in in, um, in the miniatures from the Kuliata Rami or the Hidiata Rami in, in, from Delhi, they're just standard composite bows. Yeah. If you look at the surviving bows in Korea for crossbows, they're standard composite bows. So some technologies didn't move west, some technologies didn't move east. You don't see closed helmets in these. The face mask helmets that you see in Iran and and in the um, successor states to the Jochids in, in Russia and Ukraine, um, they're a different thing. They're probably, they may be, not probably, they may be descendants of the um, Roman cavalry uh, exercise helmets, the, those beautiful face helmets that had a, a metal face. But in regards to things like Kazagans, brigandines definitely were oh, really great. popular in Europe, but I, I, I can't find too many references to male sewn inside fabric. Whereas the Japanese in the East, have it uh, beat, Japanese. Yeah. They did it, right. Yeah, so I, I think the, the, the Wikipedia page for um, Jazarant has, they don't have a picture of a Jezerant from uh, or a Kazagan. They have a picture of a Japanese. Really? Sari, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. yeah in, inside a, a fabric layer. The Japanese male is a unique thing. They did actually make European style male as well. Um, but their own male, in it's kind of like flat ring with four or six oval rings coming out of it. We're all done with um, tempered and hardened wire, hardened and tempered, you would do it in that order, that, uh, so that they didn't usually have to rivet it. And it's really quite funny that in the 19th century in Germany and England, they manufactured mail made like key rings so that there were two ring round and it was hardened spring steel. And they made this into shirts and then sold it in the Sudan so there's a lot of male shirts from the Sudan are actually manufactured in Solingen and places <laughs> like that. And in fact, a lot of those Cascara swords, the blades come from Germany. Yes, that's A true. friend of mine that's bought a, an old one that had been mounted with a um, hippo hide grip and scabbard. Yes. And when we took it out, it was basically a... 18th or 19th century copy of a medieval arming sword with the, the running wolf stamps on it and everything. I mean, it looks <laughs> so much like a medieval European sword. And in the Sudan, this is exactly what they wanted. And so barrel loads of these sword blades would come out and they would be mounted as cascaras in the Sudan. And um, of course, 19th century explorers would go out and say, ah, look at these crusader sword blades. <laughs> Of course. And there are some locally made ones as well. Have you handled them as well? Yeah, yeah, I've handled a couple. They're, 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 the, the blades are, are, are quite thin, very sharp. Well, when they were new, they were very sharp. And they're quite easy to maneuver, I found. Yes, and there are some of them, as you said, they're European, definitely from Zollingen, you see that. And some of them are locally made. And they, you can tell the local locally made one when they try to imitate these. Uh, you see oh, yeah. that? Yeah. You know, it's really crude. Have you seen that? Yeah, but the same thing happened in India. Um, yes. 
I've, I've got a, a, a Ferengi, and Ferengi obviously means foreigner, um, and right. particularly a Westerner. Um, yeah. And this type of sword often had European blades. Yes. But if an Indian smith wanted to make a blade that looked like a European blade, they could copy all the marks and everything. And occasionally there are mistakes in like Andre, Andrea Ferrari. Um, there'll be mistakes in, in the form of the letters or something like that. And that's how you tell. Because the sides were perfectly good. I yeah. mean, my Ferengi has actually got a, a like a, a very long watered steel blade, uh, which is unusual because they normally were made with imported blades. Um, but you see these things and you it has to make you think when you see something, don't necessarily assume it's what it looks like. Yeah. Check it out in detail. I mean, uh, it's, John. You just uh, regarding guys or Kant or Jezerant or the way you want to say it, we say, it, um, do did Chinese have examples like that as well? The Chinese. The Chinese, by and large, didn't use mail very much. Yeah. Um, that technically they could make it, but uh, most mail in China was imported from Central Asia. Yeah. There are paintings from the Qing dynasty yeah. showing um, male three-quarter length shirt armors being used by the cavalry, but it's exposed. The Chinese were much uh, more interested in making um, brigandine. Exactly. So little plates riveted to the inside of a shirt. Uh, and they, I think, may have developed the most ergonomic design for their scarves like a european one would have rows of plates and if you've seen you'll see them on youtube and that um they're not terribly bad they're quite good looking with rows of three rivets and some of these things have like 1300 rivets in a shirt rivets are solid pieces of metal they add to the weight of the shirt but they're not necessarily functional, like all those rows that have stopped them being torn. What the Chinese did was they made little square scales and uh, on the center line, they had a hole at the top. On the edge, they had a hole on one side or the other. And on the halfway down point on the edge, they had another hole. So there's three rivets per plate. And when you put them all together, you get a row of rivets and then a row of double spaced rivets and then a row of rivets and a row of double spaced rivets. The number of rivets was much smaller. The number of plates was much higher. The armors were more flexible and European brigandines were worn tight. Like they were form fitted to your body. They were, you know, um, strapped or buttoned up tight. And so that they couldn't move very much. The Chinese ones were loose. So they were like a, uh, Technically speaking, they were like a vest. The shoulders were separate pieces. So you put your arms through your vest, you did up the buttons in the front, and it hung loose past your waist. Your belt for your quivers and your swords were under it, not on top of it. And the skirts uh, of the armor that covered your legs were under that again. So that when you moved, the whole thing moved freely. And uh, there were a series of tests done with heavyweight longbows uh, by. Um, Mark Stretton published in um, an archery mag magazine whose name has slipped my memory for a moment. And when he initially was shooting these 160-pound uh, bows or whatever at um, Brigandine Armour, because his system was he would get a freshly deceased, deceased pig, uh, which is structurally very similar to a human, but before rigor mortis had set in, he had a farmer, one of his pigs died from disease and he couldn't sell it because it was diseased or age because it was tasteless. He would call up Stratton, Stratton would go out, they'd dress the pig in armor and then they would shoot arrows at it. So the, the texture of the flesh and the bone and everything was like a living person. And uh, when he first tested brigandine, shooting these powerful bows, the arrows didn't go through it because it moved. And the, Was the it a European version for Brigandine? Just a European version. He just put a European one loosely 
on a pig. And all the other armors, male and, and plate and that, he could make serious damage on, but he couldn't on this. Then someone told him, well, but these were worn tight on the body. So he put it tight on the pig carcass. Arrows went straight through it. And this is the difference, see? The, the Chinese style was more efficient because it wasn't worn close to the body. And the European style was more beautiful in the European terms of beauty because it followed the shape of the body perfectly and fitted so perfectly. Uh, there's a, there is an argument that, um, that because it fitted better at the waist, then you distributed the weight better. But the thing is, both the Chinese and the European one never went much below like the top third of the thighs. So there wasn't that much weight. No. Whereas you had a male hawbook that went down to your knees. That's a lot of weight. But these things were quite light. And so uh, there wasn't I a Can I say, knee. Uh, yeah. if you imagine, you know, as a guy who wears armor and also I fight, uh, you know, full contact with armor, can I ask you something? If I make a Gazo Kant, right? Gazo Kant, and male, mm -hmm. and then this. And it comes and covers uh, knee, my knees as well, or a bit. Let's put it that way. And I make the same thing, Chinese model, right? Like a brigandine, Chinese model. The Chinese should weigh less, correct? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Uh, That's it. It, 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 uh, in the Chinese model, the, the, the upper part would only go down um, basically just below the groin. And then there would be a separate part tied around your waist that would cover your legs. Even if it would weigh the whole thing, also cover leg covers, still the Chinese armor should be less uh, tiresome because it weighs less. Am I correct to say that? Yeah, because the, the, the density of metal, I mean, you know, there's a lot of holes in mail, right? Right. So a Kazakhstan has a lot of empty space in it. But when you add it all up, a male shirt... Sorry about that. That was a ping from you. <laughs> a male shirt um, is, it's not, it, its great advantage is it sits close to the body and it transfers the weight quite effectively. A long male shirt really needs to be tied in at the waist. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the brigandine, depending on the structure, like the European structure has a huge number of rivets compared to the, and, and short, short that way, long that way plates. Whereas the Chinese ones, the plates are regularly squared. So that the number of rivets per square centimeter or whatever is much lower. Um, the fact is though that the brigandines that we have surviving from China were all made after the introduction of guns. So you've got to ask yourself, were they meant to stop anything other than swords and spears? And I, my guess is they weren't. Earlier brigandine armors, there are Chinese encyclopedias describing them. Uh, there's, I've, I've got a book um, in the other room uh, which has a breakdown of Song Dynasty uh, lamellar armors, right? Which this comes from a, a encyclopedia of, of military subjects, and they can tell you how many scales each type of armor contained, which and weights, uh, based on the fact of what type of Warrior. So if you're an archer, you would have, you know, so many uh, hundreds of scales. If you were a, um, a, a front rank cavalryman, you would have different size and thickness of scales. So each armor type has its advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of a Kazagan is you go, so you're the, you know, the royal guard for a sultan or a shah or, or um or a, 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 a pasha or whatever, you can look like just a normal person. Yeah. And the thing is, if you knew that this person was wearing armor on their body, you would strike towards the head. But if you don't know, you would go for the biggest part of the body. And if that's armored, then your first blow is wasted. <laughs> and that gives the person an advantage. There's a whole series of British writings from the 19th century in India where they were fighting the Sikhs and various other people who wore mail, but it was often concealed. And the British originally made fun of it because, well, you know, look, armor is so outdated. We've got um, 
brown besses and they can shoot a hole through the armor and the guy and out the other side, which is true. But when you got to hand to hand fighting, if you kept hitting a guy with a sword and it kept bouncing off because he had mail on, ha, wow. <laughs> so don't make your armor too heavy because you can't move fast enough. But make it effective enough that if you get in close quarters, that guy with his somewhat blunt sword, um, and I'm not saying they're all blunt, um, but uh, he's not going to make that big a dent on you. <laughs> I must admit, um, very curved swords like Shamshirs and, and um, I mean, later Shamshirs and, and, and certain types of college, um, they probably could make a fair bit of damage on Mail because one of my friends uh, demonstrated the cutting power of a, um, I think it was a pillage, but it might have been a shamshir because he had some beautiful shamshirs. Um, by cutting a, a cooper and nickel coin, uh, one of our standard coins at the time, in half with just a flick like that. Yeah, I agree with you. Because the, the, you, you know, the back of these swords is quite thick. Yeah. And they're a wedge shape. I mean, I've got a somewhere over here. Let me see if I can dig it out from behind. I've got a whole wall of arrows over here. And <laughs> oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, split back scabbard. Uh, quite a functional blade. Is it, it pattern welded has... or is it crucible steel? I think it's pattern welded myself. Okay. I haven't etched it. Um, it actually, it has fake calligraphy on it. That's not real. No, it's not real. Yes. <laughs> it was done by somebody who, who couldn't read. But <laughs> yes. they copied, they thought they were copying something. Notice this, what's really interesting, it's still got the wrapping on the hilt. Oh, that's right. That's it. That's, mm -hmm. So this would also originally have had a loop coming out of it. Mm -hmm. So that when you put your hand on the hilt, the loop would... Yeah, can find. It's quite well balanced for cutting. Um, this is a broad blade because this type of this is almost a palakalich. It's got a it's got a yelman on the back, but it's not particularly sharp. It's a bit sharp. The front part of the blade is about twice as sharp. It uh, you know what I noticed that some of the um, modern ones the the hilt extends too far. All of the Persian and Turkish swords that I've seen and handled, the hilt, uh, admittedly, I've got a small hand, so my hand doesn't quite close up on the pommel, but the hilts were quite firm. And they're also, in this, you can see it widens out towards the tip. This is typical of Turkish swords. Persian swords tend to be the same um, width all the way down. You know, as you said, you're absolutely right. I've seen and handled, as you know, many original shamshirs. There are some shamshirs, not many, but there are some shamshirs with a really long handle, but they have a pommel cap. And I have a quite thick hand. And when I put, most of them fit completely, but some yeah. of them, some, they don't. It's so long. Some of them beat. My, my guess is that some of this is size difference for this sword was made for a certain person. Yeah. And some of it is, uh, if you look at Shirazi miniatures from the 1330s to the 1370s, there are swords that actually have hilts that continue the curve. Yeah. Like a Tachi in Japan, except they've got this tiny little cross guard. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't know. I've once got to handle a um, 16th century Tachi in battle mounds. And it was beautifully balanced. The, the modern katanas are pip heavy compared to Tachis. They, they just don't, I've, I've handled a lot of katanas and some of them are very nice to hold. A lot of the Shinto style, uh, the modern ones, when I say modern, um, uh, in the class, that they are, um, are made much solider. Whereas the old ones, the blades seem to be a little bit thinner and better balanced. And I find with this, like this, I can feel it pulling my hand down. But 
I can also, if I swing it, I can turn it and stop it immediately. Yes. Whereas um, it, with a, with a, I mean, this has got less of a curve than, and than, I mean, I've got a, a, um, a you've seen photographs of it because you helped confirm the translations of the cartouches. I've got a Turkish style shamshir made by an Iranian smith in the 1740s. And um, even without, it, it's missing its cross guard because that was solid silver and somebody stole it and melted it down. Um, even without that, its balance is superb. And I, I once got to handle a dated 1690s Turkish shamshir style pillage. And again, perfect balance. That was for a person whose hand was maybe that much longer than mine. But even so, it was still perfectly balanced. There is another thing, I'm, I'm sure you've seen that in miniatures, I think in my one of my books I've sh shown it, you know, and then there are also references in Alam Ara, Shamshi Dodasti or Dodasta Zadan, means using your both hands to, to hit the Shamshi. Mm -hmm. And you see in the miniature, this is one of these long handled Shamshirs. Yeah, the um, is and, and is, sometimes they curve that way. And as I said, in the Shiraz ones, they curve. He, he's holding the pommel cap in the left hand, he, yeah. like this, and then but, he's but hitting. You know that there's, there is a beautiful sword that belonged to uh, Mehmed II Al Fatih in, in the conqueror of Constantinople, which is clearly a two handed sword. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's, it's a beautiful coach. I mean, I mean this so one is a bit. It's not two-handed really in the miniature. I mean, it is like the pommel cap comes here, so he's holding the pommel cap in the oh, middle yeah. of his left hand. You see what I mean? Yeah, like exactly. That. Like this. Like this. Exactly. Like this. I mean, Persian, I mean, Persian pommel cap, right? Persian pommel yeah, cap. Yeah, yeah, which is more straight. This, yes. Again, yeah. this, is, this is classic. This is the right shape and everything for a Turkish one. Yes. Um, the uh, the Persians are straighter. The the to me from the ones I've handled. Now, honestly, I've only handled about four Persian shamshirs. Um, one I sent you the photograph of uh, that belonged to my friend that had the beautiful gold and silver belt and the and the the watered steel fittings with the inlaid gold and everything. It also had finger grooves. Yes, yes. <laughs> now, that was beautiful. That had a great balance. Um, the the others, they all the grips seemed to be a little bit square in cross section. So they like they weren't oval like European swords. They were square. You had much more control of where the edge was. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, um, as I said, what brought up this subject was these swords, in the right circumstances, can cut through mail. I agree with you. You know, be, yeah. when I was uh, going to Iranian museums, because, you know, lots of things are sad because we don't fight with sharps, right? Then I saw on many, many I talked to Dr. Arjmandi, we are going to analyze them because he's a physicist, right? And I saw on many mail from Safavid period, which are kept in Iranian museum, like a military museum, there are attempts of cuts. You see, yeah. like a cut. And they are really hard and they're riveted and hard rings. And you see yeah. cut, and then you see that some of them are really cut, some of them half cut, but then you see it's not haphazard. You see many cuts on the mail. You see, so yeah. then they were cutting it. Right, they were attempting to cut it. 